Imagine yourself in a few days from now. It's Monday morning. You're driving your car to work, guided by the navigation system to avoid traffic. At the office, you send a few emails to your coworkers from Asia. Then you print a weekly report for your boss. And around 2 p.m., you enter the kitchen uh, to heat your food in the microwave oven and eat something. Looks like another casual day. Or was it? Let's step back and think again what actually have we done today in terms of technology that we have used. How many of you are familiar with uh, relativity theory? Who are the experts? Hands up. Okay, neither am I. Um, <clears throat> but the truth is that understanding just the very basics um, of how it works allows you also to understand the GPS system. A GPS system is a set of satellites that travel through our orbit at the speed of about four kilometers per second. They're also less affected by the Earth's gravity uh, because they are farther away than we are, right? Uh, and we know that uh, both uh, gravity and the speed affect the way the time flows. And GPS is indeed uh, all about measuring time very, very precisely and doing a lot of computations on that. So <clears throat> if uh, GPS would not compensate for these differences, uh, then we would have an error of measurement of about uh, 10 kilometers per day, and this would accumulate. So imagine yourself standing in the Wrocław Marketplace, you take out your GPS unit, ask for the position, and got Wrocław Marketplace. Fine. Then, after a month, you repeat the experiment. You take the GPS device, uh, ask for the position, and got center of uh, Tatry Mountains, 300 kilometers away. Well, this normally would be pretty good news if it weren't just for a minor uh, positioning error, right? Well, GPS, of course, doesn't work that way. We do compensate, and we have uh, the ability to measure at about three, three meters. So, <clears throat> yet, uh, GPS has been developed in the 1980s. It, it became fully operational in 1995. Uh, a lot of things changed since then. Uh, as we speak, the European Union is launching a Galileo system that will allow us to measure the distance, the position, uh, with a precision of one centimeter. Just think of that. You have a phone with Galileo system enabled. You turn it on, and the system can actually tell if you are scratching your ear or scratching your nose. This is totally different for this system. Just think about this precision. Okay. And yet, it wasn't all that we have used uh, while traveling to work. We also used live traffic data to know which road is the best, which one is the fastest, where there are no jams, right? Uh, how does it work? Uh, well, dri drivers, I mean the computers in, in your cars, send information regarding your current position and speed to the central system. Central system processes it. Uh, if you look at it, uh, there are millions of users who send such data 24 hours a day, as there's always a day at some part of the world, right? So, how is it handled? There is really no magic behind it. There are just lots and lots of servers uh, that do process this tremendous amount of uh, traffic in real time. <clears throat> just to give you an overview, uh, you all know Google, right? Okay. I take it as a yes. Uh, so Google uh, is estimated to have about one million servers to, s to handle all their services. Think about the scale. Uh, one single server takes about 600 watts of power. Now, if you multiply it by a million, you will get around 12% of all the electricity produced in Bełchatów power plant, the biggest coal power plant in Europe. And this is just for the servers. If you add the cooling systems for the server rooms, you'll end up with about 18% of uh, Bełchatów power, uh, which is one terawatt. Uh, to give you uh, an overview, this is 3.5% of all the electricity that is produced in Poland, the whole country. Okay, we made it to the office. We're now sending an emails. We send a few emails back and there. Uh, sending emails is simple, everyone does that, right? Well, yes and no. Definitely everyone does that, but it's not really that simple that people imagine. But the most interesting thing here is that you have sent this email from your computer under your desk. Most likely, this computer has been bought less than three years ago. So if you look at the benchmarks, you'll notice uh, that the, this computer can do between 50 and 150 billion mathematical operations per second. Now, if you look on the list of top 500 best performing computers on the world uh, throughout times, you will notice that your computer is the single most powerful computer ever created by, by humankind 
until about 1995. Moreover, your computer under your desk would still be on that list until around 2002. So what you did, you just got yourself a supercomputer from a decade ago and use it to send an email. Just keep that in mind next time you send a picture of a cute kitties to a friend of yours. Okay, so we're printing reports. What's special about the laser printer? Of course, the laser. Uh, laser is a very interesting device because it has been developed solely by human thought. Uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century, when, where people worked on the quantum physics, they realized that something like laser should exist. We, we should be able to create it. And indeed we did. In 1960, we created the first working laser device. Back at the time, people believed that, that there are no such things as, la as lasers in the universe, that nature doesn't produce laser light. Uh, well, this is actually wrong. In 1995, we were able to discover the natural lasers. But keep in mind, this was almost a century after we have thought about the existence of laser and a few decades after we have actually created one. So back at the time, in 1960s, when people created the first working laser, it was so enormous discovery for them, it's so artificial, uh, that uh, people were joking that this invention is looking for a job. They really didn't know what to do with it. Fortunately for us, now we do. We have laser printers, laser pointers, um, uh, laser weapons system, laser fusion reactors, uh, CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, engravers, laser cutters, all that stuff. Lasers are around us. They are behind every corner of our, li of our lives, literally. Okay, 2 p.m., eating time. What is special about this device? Well, at least two things. First is its brain. It's an 8-bit microcontroller, most likely Intel uh, 8051 family or similar. These types of devices can do around 2 million uh, mathematical operations per second. Now, if you compare it to other supercomputer that has been developed here in Wroclaw in the 1970s, uh, this whole closet of electronics uh, could do around uh, 600,000 additions per second. It could also multiply. This is not a joke. It was used back then, the very serious scientific computations, so it could multiply as well. Uh, but if you put them side by side, 8051 is really smaller, even if you put it vertically. Uh, actually, it fits into the microwave oven instead of pretending to be one. Uh, but if you put them at the right scale, it will look more or less like this. You can see 8051 there, right? It's there. If you can see it, just take my word for it. It's there. Okay? Uh, so even though this enormous difference in size, uh, when it comes to a computational speed, this little guy there is three times faster than Odra. And all of this just to serve you a warm meal. Right? Okay, so why such a powerful device in a microwave oven? Come on. Uh, the answer is very simple. Uh, it's just because it is so cheap, you know. Uh, at current, current technology level, it doesn't really matter if we make a processor that, that makes 2,000 operations per second or 2 million operations per second. It will just cost the same. So we just make the fastest one and put them everywhere we can, including the microwave oven. So having this powerful equipment back in your kitchen, next time your child comes to you and says, uh, help me with math, you say, uh, I'm tired, just go and ask your microwave oven to do it for you. Okay? Okay. But... Speaking of microwave ovens, uh, why do we keep them in our homes? Why do we buy them in the first place? Of course, to measure the speed of light. Uh, what, am I, what, am I about, what I am about to show you can be safely done at, done at home, and only one single bar of chocolate will be harmed, and only slightly. OK, so when you enable microwave oven, uh, it, it produces so-called a standing wave. Uh, the wave has a node and an anti-node. An interesting part is that the microwave heats uh, only uh, around the anti-nodes while it doesn't heat at all in nodes. So if you remove the rotating plate from the microwave and put uh, something that can melt in a steady location, you can actually detect where are these places, the hot and the cold ones. So if you put a chocolate there, you can actually check the distance uh, between, in this case, the cold places. I was able to measure around 6.8 centimeters. This is very rough because, well, the hot and cold uh, places are really not the exact science, as you can see. But uh, we'll need one more thing. We'll need the frequency of the microwave oven. 
This is actually very simple because it's usually just written on a sticker on the back of the microwave oven, so you just read it. Uh, it's typically around 2.5 gigahertz. Now we use some basic high school uh, math and physics uh, to do some computations. So we have a lambda, which is a wavelength, a wavelength uh, C, which is, which is the speed of light, and F, which is a frequency. So the wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. So from that, uh, that formula, you can extract the, that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. Okay, so let's put in some numbers. Uh, these are the ones I have actually measured, and I uh, got myself a result that the speed of light is more or less uh, 333,000 uh, kilometers per second. This is interesting because, as you know, it differs from the actual speed of light only by about 11%. This is a very nice experiment for under one euro, including both the electricity and the chocolate, and the truth is that chocolate stays with you. Okay? So, within a single day, we have used quantum physics, uh, relativity theory, both applied. We have used supercomputer from a few years ago to send an email, and we did it all without even noticing. And that's the beauty of progress. It makes complicated things simpler and simpler over time. If this doesn't convince you we live in a fascinating time, you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy your hot chocolate while everything magically happens for you, right? There is, a <laughs> there is a old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. It's sometimes called a Chinese curse because interesting times historically mean uh, the times of unsettlement, uh, wars, and stuff like that. So definitely a negative meaning. I argue that since around the end of the 20th century, this is no longer true. We do live in an interesting times, and it is a good thing. I believe uh, we should honor this era by learning and cognition. May all of us live in fascinating times. Thank you.